Joshua chapter 6, verse 1. If you'd like to, I'm going to be reading out of my Bible, the New King James. Usually, if you'll notice, I have a tablet, and... No, there's, there's just so, it was so weird for me to get used to using an electronic device, preaching so many years, and then I got used to it, and I was like, I started reading this, and I kind of misplaced my tablet too, and then I thought, you know what, I like this. There's something about having it. I do like the electronic tablet, because there's times I'm here and I can sit and jump between translations and see things, but I don't know, you don't see books anymore like you used to, do you? So anyway. Let's go ahead and read Joshua chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and its mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all of your men. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests will bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you will march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horns, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests, and he said to them, Take up the ark, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let them who is armed advance before the ark. So it was, when Joshua had spoken to the people, that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpet, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make a noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth, till the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city around once. When they came into the camp, And they lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning. And the priests took the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went and continually, went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guard had come after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day, They marched around the city once, and they returned to the camp, and so for six days. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early, about the dawn of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, only they marched around the city seven times. The seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord's destruction, and it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in her house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall become, they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him. And they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep, donkey, and the edge of the sword. But Joshua said to the two men who spied out the county, the country, go into harlot's house, the harlot's house, and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. So this is a story that you're probably familiar with. 
to me, it's one of the greatest stories that I remember growing up and listening to. And, and kids love it, don't they? I mean, this is one that, you know, I remember as a little kid in Bible class that we got to get up out of our chair and we would sing the song and march around and they, I don't know, somebody would act like they're blowing trumpets or something and it was a little different every time, but it was amazing. There was just something about that story that was just so amazing to me because then all of a sudden we would all get to shout, which, you know, in church you're always told to be quiet as kids. So it was kind of like, you know, we get to shout. And then, then these walls would tumble down. One time we had like blocks or something in the Bible class. They knocked, we got to knock them down and stuff. So it's, it stays there, though. You know, for a lot of us, as we grow up, it's a great Bible class for children. But that story... Really? You know, that's, that's the thing about us as children is that we're very pure and innocent when we're young. And we can see God's word and we seem to have this ability to really pull into it and understand it. But there's something happens to us, like a lot of other things, that as we grow older, that all of a sudden we get tainted, don't we? We become a little mixed with belief and reality. Because why? Well, everyone around us starts to influence us. Our society starts to try to tell us that these stories that are in the Bible are allegorical. In other words, they're not real. They're just extremely symbolic of something that God is trying to teach us. And so you'll hear sermons all the time about the walls and what they represent and even, you know, just all these great things. And now don't get me wrong. Those are absolutely applicable. They really are. When you think about those stories, though, they're not just children's stories. A man went into a very large fish, or well, if you want to call it, <laughs> a whale or a fish. It was huge. The point was, God made him, and this man went into the well. That also is a story that has stayed in childhood. And somehow, as we grow older, we go, now, come on, really? I've been fishing a lot, you know, and I've never seen something that big. And then if you're born in the desert, you've never seen anything close to it. But then you start seeing pictures in the Mediterranean where they've got these huge sharks, they say, and actually they can. And then, and then so we, what am I doing? You see what I'm doing? I'm trying to put things into perspective according to what I know and see and have been told. And what do I do? I start drifting. We start drifting away from the simplicity of what God has told us originally and that is true. As spoken. And that's upsetting because it strips away the magnificence of the power of our God. Why couldn't he do that? Why couldn't he make a fish? If you believe that there is a God and he's all powerful and he has all this fantastic abilities, then why can't you believe that he could create a fish in a moment's notice while a man's sinking through the water? Why can't we believe that these people could walk around this wall and shout and they all just crumble down? Because there's not a man on this world that can do that. That's the point. Not a man can do that. So to me, it's very insulting to God when we start trying to keep our Bible stories in the children's classes. And we allow modern philosophies and technologies and scientific exploring and all this stuff to say, uh, that really couldn't happen. Don't let that happen to you. Don't. This one, I think, is a fascinating one to me because being in the military and then going through officer's candidate school, we were trained on... Basically, they train everybody to, to be an infantry officer. You know, so whether you're going to be, you know, administrative officer or like I was, they called us duck hunters, air defense officer, didn't matter. If, when you went through the officer training, you could go out to the infantry. They trained you all the same. One of the things that they trained us on was what the Army calls an op order or an operations order. And they go through and they have a five-paragraph op order that they publish. And then they amend it, and they amend it, and so they have Frago, and they do all this stuff. But the initial one is one to help prepare that military unit, no matter what size it is, 
So you would have one that large, a huge one, but it was still a five-paragraph operations order that come down from the Pentagon. And it was written at their level, and then would trickle down, but it kept the same format because it was very effective in communicating the same concepts but bringing it down. So as a company commander, I would receive these orders from our battalion, and the, he was talking about the entire battalion. And I would have to take from that order and then create another one that was specifically for my soldiers and then brief them on it. So all of that to tell you, every time <laughs> we have a military engagement, my mind goes to that. Abraham, well, we won't get off on that. I'll chase that rabbit later. But, you know, Abraham is one where I look at some of the engagements he's had and I start thinking militarily and I'm like, wow. This is another one. So I, I kind of put it into that format. I, I thought, okay, Ron, you're Joshua, and you're going to take Jericho. That's your mission, and I received this military operations order. And by the way, you know the other thing? They had these really cool names to them. They'll call them Op Freedom Fight or, you know, Operation Enduring Whatever. So mine is Operation Jericho. And so I kind of put it together, and this is what it would kind of look like if I was to try to plan for something like this. And I want you to see it this way because it's important as we go through this lesson to bring it back around to help you to see the bigger picture, what I want you to understand and walk away from here with. So the first thing is we have what we call the mission, a situation. So what is the situation? Well, we have this city, Jericho. And that in the geographics, you look at all the population, you look at the culture, you look at things like that. The problem with this city is they have very strong defensive fortifications. So that's a part of the situation. How big of the force? We're not given that information. Joshua doesn't know how many is on the other side of those walls. So that, that's an issue there too. Because you don't know how many you should use or do I have enough. So that right there starts to you know, cause an alarm. We see as well they have two large walls on a slope. And now... I'm only fighting with what I have at that present day. So I don't have airborne. I don't have helicopters. I don't have, you know, cannons to just blast things apart. What do I have? I got men on foot with swords. Oh, we might have some donkeys and stuff like that, but that's it. So we have two walls that we have to ascend up. That's another problem. As a military commander, you never want to fight uphill. You want to have the high ground because there's, it's very impossible to fight and win fighting going up. But then you've got to go over these barriers while those are standing on the wall doing something to you, you know, or being able to come at you. So that's one of the other problems. The other problem is they can sit and wait you out. They have the ability and food and water sources. So how long can you sit? with a million people. You see, Joshua not only has a military force, but he's traveling with a lot of baggage, isn't he? He's traveling with a nation. There's another problem, is that your troops aren't really that well trained. This is the first time after they've crossed over the Jordan that now with the new commander, Joshua, is going to take this on. And look what God has given him to take it with. Couldn't we start? I would have raised my hand. During the briefing from God, I would have said, uh, 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 Lord, could we take a little one first? Get my guys a little used to what's going on. I mean, these guys have never, a lot of them never seen any of this. And we're fixing to start this invasion. And they really don't have that type of understanding. What are the friendly forces? None. You are in complete hostile area. Which means when you deploy with your forces and you go out, that anybody else and everybody in the land of Canaan that they were coming into knew about them. Now, luckily, most of them were really afraid of them. But the one problem was it also meant you had a whole lot of them that if they were smart enough, they could have united on you and came in while you're doing that little walk around and attack your supplies and attack. So you, how do you secure that? A million, over a million people. So you got logistics issues. You're going to sit there, and this little city is so well set up. So that's that's a big one. 
So what's our mission? Take the city. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But it's not just take the city. He says, utterly destroy it. So there's a lot of things that when we think about kind of the idea, you know, you have to have the capabilities to complete all of it. All of it. You notice that in the reading there, he even instructed them that once they went in, that one of the things they had to do is make sure you don't take things that are considered sinful, things that we are not supposed to pick up because it's supposed to be destroyed. All the precious metals and things like that were to be gathered up and taken to the treasury. So he was telling his soldiers very specific details and telling them what they were to do once they got inside that city. But they had to totally destroy it. God is the commander. He's the one that's telling them, this is what I want. And I want utter destruction. You can take all the precious metals and bring that into the treasury of the tabernacle. So that's, that's a problem. So how do you execute it? Well, if I receive this order, I don't have a choice. See, that's the other issue in the military is you don't get a choice. I have a little wiggle room. You know, sometimes like when I would get a certain order, they'd give me an area to go out and place my unit. And so I could look and I could go, well, we're going to do this. But overall, I had to accomplish that. So his is very detailed. God is micromanaging this. In the military, you don't like those commanders. You've got to have some maneuver room. You've got to have some flexibility to adapt and overcome as things are happening. You don't like this type of restrictive direction. You see a lot of problems we're building up here. A lot of problems with this whole plan. <laughs> well, just not to mention that we're just going to walk around it. How do you tell these guys that are going to get blooded, you know, and get ready to go in and take this land? Well, we're just going to walk around it for six days toot the horn, and then we're going to come back and camp. We're going to do that for six days. We're just going to walk around. And oh, by the way, what do you think your enemy thought? This is not your typical attack or besiegement of a city, even for that day and age. They look like clowns out there. Jericho is sitting there on the wall, and the king's sitting there going, what? What are they doing? Okay, day one, okay. Maybe they're doing a little reconnaissance around the city to find a weakness, and they're walking around. But the other thing is, you don't show your forces. You don't show your enemy how many people you have. Joshua's showing them everything. He's taking all of his military and his most treasured item, the ark, made of gold, and he's exposing it out and walking around the city. And the city's sitting there gone. And then the next day he comes out and does it again. So your order is you're going to go out there and you're going to have to lead these people. Now, think about it. You're just an average guy. You're, you're serving in Joshua's army. And your commander, Joshua, comes in and says, oh, well, yeah, boys, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to line up in this order. By the way, that's a march order in the military. We have those. He specifies exactly the sequence of how they're to line up and go in that circle. There's a purpose to all that that we won't go all into about. But... When you think about it, listening to that, put yourself in their shoes for a moment. They cross the Jordan. We're going to go in and we're going to do battle. Imano, Imano, man. We're going to go in and we're going to start killing and blood and all this. We're, they're pumped, man. You ever seen a bunch of soldiers? Uh, you know, they're getting ready for deployment and they want to go in and they want to jump out of those airplanes. They want to crash their tanks. They want to go. And then all of a sudden the commander goes, no, we're going to walk around the wall. We're going to walk around. What? And I, you can't even talk to them. You know, there's a lot of smack talk, though. You know, fighters before fights, you know, that little, mm-mm. Nothing. And I know that them on that wall were mocking them. Hey, you Hebrews, ha, what are you doing? Is circus? Come on, man, you think you're so tough? You can't say nothing. There is so much psychology behind that silence that after five days, if you had a force that kept doing this and never batted an eye or said a word to you in response, it would start to be a little unnerving. It really would. 
But you've got to go out and execute those first days, and then you're walking around. So you're going to walk around, and on that seventh day, then the only change, really, is that we finally have a point we reach when the horns are going to signify a blast, and then everybody's going to yell. And then you notice that in that, when he's giving that instructions, he tells them that when you shout, the walls are going to fall down. Now, when has any of them ever seen something like that happen? They've seen God do a lot of things. And they wavered on that. Remember? They come across to the Red Sea and they start complaining. You know, they would lose that. But they, it, now you have to take these people and then they're gonna, God's going to perform something they've never seen. And then the walls are going to fall down. It took a lot of courage and a lot of faith as well for those men to not feel like they're being ridiculous to sit there and follow Joshua. And again, they're not really, they think they're ready to fight, but they're not. God is taking care of this whole thing all the way through. So after this, he says the walls are going to fall down. Now I got a picture here. This is it's kind of to scale of what's going on about th what they were facing. If you look to the bottom left over here, that's, that's kind of to scale what if they were to approach the wall would have to try to do if they're going to scale over that wall. So every day you're walking around and you're having a look at those two walls. And it's more than that because they plastered in between the two walls there. It was slick. So you, as a Hebrew warrior, are going to have to walk around for six, seven, seven days and look at what you have to try to crawl over. And then he says, they're going to fall down. Those were massive walls. Massive walls. This is looking from the top down on that city of Jericho. And this is kind of showing you the way that they had this double wall barrier going around the outer. Um, and then the inner wall as well. So whoever made it over the first wall was probably going to possibly get wiped out. And then they try to come up over that second wall, you know, extremely great fortification and they also had that stream you can see on this picture here where they have water source you can't quite I forgot to go ahead and include it but that green one actually goes on around and includes that great water source there now again this is a site that has remained named geographically over there in the Middle East to this day Jericho the, it's a mound and, and so a lot of people said, well, we have a city there. We, yeah, that, that's the location. But no, you couldn't do this. It could not fall down. Now, I don't know how God was able to take voices and cause walls to come down. Doesn't matter. The walls came down, and they have found them. They have found, and now they, you know, as they start to dig through the archaeologists, they have found this. Now, there's also the difference, and there are some of the walls that are there currently that are from previous earthquakes because the area was prone to that. So you go, oh, see, Ron, you almost had, you're talking yourself out of it, Ron. You just said, yeah, well, does it mean that God can't use an earthquake to bring those walls down right then and there? Why is that, why is that ridiculous? That would be perfect, wouldn't it? To have an earthquake all of a sudden hit. So that area was already prone. So it was set. The other thing that's very unique. Is that the wall layer that they have found. Has it shows damage. And also the fact that there was something. Much more catastrophic. That was going on there. And the clay pots that they found. That were there. They were left full. And they said. That was kind of different too. Something rapidly happened to where the people either evacuated but they left those there and they wouldn't and whoever maybe if, if they were overrun we're looking at like they don't believe in the bible okay whatever enemy of overrun why didn't they take them we know why right the other thing it shows is fire so not only at the same date and time of when these walls where they that they came down at the same time there's something more than just these other walls have fallen. That one timeline area where they excavated shows that there was also a massive fight or something occurred. Now, we don't have to guess because we know. The reason I share that with you is because it's not a myth. It's not allegorical. It's true. 
It's powerful. And it has some great lessons. And I tried to bring those out and try to show you those as somebody who was a Hebrew that was trying to sit there and understand what's going on as he watched all of that. He was just like us. You would, he would have been just like us sitting there going, this is a terrible plan. And then Joshua's commanders as well going, can't we just try to go over that? Well, no, no. We're going to do it exactly the way God said to do it. Here's just another picture of an area on the, on the hill there uh, in Jericho that they have dug up. And you can find a lot today with everybody's access to the Internet. You can find them there. It's amazing. It really is. Not only that, it's a very fertile, beautiful area. I never realized it because to me, I just think everything out there is desert and stuff. But it is gorgeous, that area there. The key point I want to start with is that God's ways are not ours. That's probably the biggest lesson. If you fall asleep now and forget, I want you to wake up later and go, God's ways are not our ways. We have a hard time comprehending many things, many things that God is telling us to do and guide us. The Apostle Paul really clears that up in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 25-27. He says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble not are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. So everything you think that is illogical about God is logical because God has made it that way. He has set it up against our pride and our arrogance to demonstrate to us time and time again a man can't go into a fish. An axe head can't float on water. You can't divide a sea and have it go through. You can't have the type of plagues and things that struck Egypt. I was just watching it last night. One of these documentaries trying to waste away the idea that somehow they were just natural phenomena that struck Egypt. Why do you do that? Why do you have to do that? What's your motivation behind that? You don't want to be accountable. That's the problem. Because for you to accept these things means then there's a God. And if there's a God, then there's a judgment. There's a standard in which we must uphold to his standard, not mine. And you notice one of the things Paul says here is, there's not a whole lot of really wise men and educated people of this day and age that are attracted to the gospel. And especially to the Greeks and the Romans. Oh, this whole story of the man Jesus from Nazareth being a god, that's just silliness. Because all the gods we know, the Roman gods, oh no, we, they would not take that for a moment in letting one of their gods go down and have them treated the way that those humans treat them and then kill them. And it was your plan to begin with as a god? Zeus would have never come up with that. That's silly. And it was for mankind, you see. It wasn't just that God did all of that, but God did it for mankind. None of their gods of that day and age would do anything like that. That was the most barbaric thought to them. Send a God down to die for them so that we can save them, the people? Send? <laughs> no. So to them, it was complete foolishness. And that's exactly why God used it. So I think today that's what happens is that people that feel their pride and their self-assurance and not really wanting to know God, they take this type of knowledge and puff themselves up and they then resist against the simplicity of what God has made so apparent. Paul says in Thessalonians also the idea that, you know, there are some people because they really don't want to know the truth. You know some of those people, right? Don't we all? Doesn't matter how much you tell them the truth, they really don't want to know it. Well, put that on a global level, and you have our society 
that really doesn't want to know the truth. And God said through Paul to the Thessalonians, there will be some who do not love the truth, and God will send upon them a deluding lie that they would believe in it. And I think that's what we see as well as some of the people saying, science is so much smarter than God. And God said, okay, there you go. And they're off. And <laughs> there's no hope because they really don't want to know to begin with anyway. With God, the next point is walls do come down. Six days. Every day they went back to camp. So I had to go, Bob. Oh, man, it was hot out there today. I almost ran out of water. Yeah, you know, that guy behind me was really complaining about his feet. I mean, it's like, oh, coming across the door. We're going to do this again tomorrow? Yeah. What do you say? We're going to get up again tomorrow, and we're going to walk around it. Do you really think that those walls will come down? Can you imagine the talk around the camps? Do you really think that these walls? Look at those walls. We've seen them for six days now. So it was as much a lesson to them to saying, I can do this and I'm going to prove it to you. And this is going to be the point that you're going to be able to launch from and accomplish so many magnificent things and take that land of milk and honey. But he had to bring those walls down. And that's exactly what he did. Our strategies seem foolish to our instincts. You know, when we look at God and the way God says certain things to us today, I have people a lot of times when we talk about certain topics, you know, that you know, we're supposed to love those who hate us. And we struggle with it because why? Why do we struggle with that? Because that's the way we've been raised. That's just the way that the world is. Again, upside down logic. God is the opposite. So that's, that's one of those things that just, it's not right for our instincts to think that we could love those who hate us. And then the next one is forgive those who've wronged you. Now, and God is saying your personal salvation is dependent upon you forgiving. You want forgiveness from God? God says, then you better do it. And it's like, why should I do that? This person doesn't deserve it. Uh, think about you and God. Do you deserve it? So again, it's God's strategies seem to rub our personal instincts in a wrong way, doesn't it? The other one is sexual intimacy before marriage. You know, that we should save it for marriage. Oh, man, look at our society today. And you have hookup apps where you can just at random have intimate you know, relationships at random. And then they wonder why divorce and all the problems that we have in personal relationships. The addiction to pornography. Because it's gratification for me and I don't care about anybody else around me. And God knows that. And he knows that true happiness comes from one man, one woman for life. He doesn't say it's going to be nice. He doesn't say that Oh, you're always going to have those little warm butterflies and, and love them. You know, that, that's the first thing that happens. They call that the, what, honeymoon phase. And then reality sets in, and he doesn't pick up his underwear, and she doesn't clean the kitchen right, and she's always nagging about you coming home late and blah, blah. And then you build a relationship. And then life hits you, doesn't it, as a married couple? And together, through those hard times, those good times, and through those moments that just go on and on, you start to look to your left and to your right, to your spouse, and realize they're the best thing that ever happened. Not the most perfect thing, but the best thing. And God knew this. But we treat it. It rubs again. God's strategy about our personal happiness seems to just rub against our instincts. Why? Because that's the way we've been brought up. That's what we see going on around us. And if everybody's doing it, then it must not be really right. Now, I don't want you to forget what Paul said in Corinthians there. He said that God chose the foolish things of the world to make those things that are in the uh, foolish things in the world to be wise. It's opposite, in other words. 
The world says, do what you want, please yourself, have all the sex you want. God says, no. And to the world, that's foolish. But that's what Paul was talking about, was saying that, again, that's what you want to believe, and that's probably why you're really miserable. Because you're letting that instinct rub you harder and not coming over and really seeing the beauty of these things that God has strategized for our happiness and our eternal soul. The other one is, you know, seeking revenge. Let God do it. And I don't mean necessarily the legal system per se, but we see that all the time. Family members, you know, when my brother was murdered and we were going through all that and meeting with the district attorney and thinking about the guy who did this and all that, it was, you know, I, I had a, a real personal struggle with that. As a victim of, you know, watching this happen to my family, my mom and everybody. And it just, it, so to me, it was like, no, let the guy out. You know, you're wanting to do that. But God says, no, don't do that. So you see, God knows the more that you're involved in that type of vengeance, what it does to you so psychologically and emotionally. You ever kill somebody and you do these things, you don't get over them. That's why he told David, no, you can't build my house. You have, you're, a, you're a man of war. You've got a lot of blood on your hands. I'll have your son do it. You take revenge in your hands, logically, the way the world says, and you will not be the same. You will destroy a little bit of yourself and sacrifice to follow the instincts of the world. And God knows that. And he wants to protect you from that and keep you in that state of peacefulness. Let God deal with it. It won't be on our time, will it? The other really hard one that rubs us the wrong way is to trust him in everything. You know, I had, I had a sister in Christ ask me years ago, years ago, said, Ron, is it a sin to worry? And for a while, you know, I thought back on that. And, and I told them then, I said, well, no, you know, I kind of blew it off. No, no. And now I wish I would have said yes. It really is. Because why are you worrying? What is it that you're worrying about? That you're holding on to? That you're not listening to what God has said? Give me your burdens. My yoke is light. What part are we not grasping to? Now it sounds foolish, doesn't it, according to the world. Be a man, be a woman, be in charge, take action. And God says, no. My yoke is light. Join me. He also said, in explaining on a daily basis, didn't he? He says, do not worry about what you have today or for tomorrow. And tomorrow, don't worry about it. Because tomorrow has enough to worry about. Look around at nature. Look at these animals and these birds. And even look at the plants as they, the lilies, as they spin and turn. They're as beautiful as rayed as Solomon. And you look at these things, and yet they're taken care of. Are you not more precious to my father than these animals and these plants and everything? I go out into the desert in the middle of the summer, and I realize, how do these things live? You dig a little bit further and it's just dead. You think it's dead. And all of a sudden you see there's some moisture. How do they live? And yet God takes care of them. And I, it's been such an object lesson to me to realize I am far more important than a creosote bush, than a barrel cactus, than a coyote. Animals that we look out there and we go, how do they live out there? And yet God takes care of them. Will he not take care of us? These are things that we look at are walls, aren't they? They really are. There are walls. Rejoicing in every circumstance? How can you do that? The world will look at you like you're crazy. I remember looking at saints when I was little and look at Christians, and then I'd find out about their lives, and I would go, why are you happy? You just told me all these horrible things and these experiences you had in your life, the depression, world wars, Korea, Vietnam, whatever it might be. 
house burns down, family died, brother and sisters, and all these things going on around them. And they're the happiest people to be around. And I'm like, I want some of that. And then as I matured, I started reading the Bible and going, who's this guy Paul that can be sitting in a prison with a death sentence hanging over his head and he talks about the peace of God that surpasses understanding? How could he be so joyful? That letter of Philippians is one of the most uplifting, encouraging letter to people out of prison. Out. He, he's writing from prison, encouraging others. Haven't you run across some of those people that are dying themselves, and yet they're the most encouraging ones? And I see that with the brothers and sisters in Christ so often. I want some of that. But I got to let that wall come down, don't I? I got to let that wall come down. Trusting in God is easier said than done. That's why he brought the wall down. It was easier to say, walk around seven times and do it than to see the walls fall down. So now, think about it. After they destroyed that city decisively, and then when Joshua said, boys, we're going to the city of Ai. Okay, that's a whole other story, but after, jo after Jericho? Am I really going to get that bloodied? I mean, I mean if, if God brought the whole city down like that, what can we not accomplish? And that's what he's doing for us personally in our lives is trying to bring down those walls. But you have to look at them. You have to identify them. You see them, but have you seen them come down? Because they have. But you know what? We seem to put them back, don't we? We bring out the bucket of mortar and we start slapping brick back on and we build that wall back up. And here we are. I can't pay my bills. I can't do this. I got family problems. We just start building that wall back up again, all over again. And then God brings it down again. And we see it. We see it. But do we really rejoice in it and learn from it? Nope. Because it seems like we get the bricks again and we start building it back up again, don't we? And that's kind of what happened to them when they go to AI. So it's not like they learned it all perfectly, but what a powerful lesson. And it's still applicable to us today. So, you know, especially when we think about the idea that how much ridicule that we do receive. And this is the problem. Why, why does ridiculing bother you? Because it embarrasses you. Why does something embarrass you? Because it humiliates you. Why do you care about humiliation? <laughs> because you don't want to look like the clown. Right? You don't want to be that guy or that girl. You don't want to be the one that fits in. It's a cool kid. I'll tell you where the cool kids are from my high school. <laughs> not right now. But they're not where you think they are. I'm coming up on my 40th high school. Yeah, a long time. I'm kind of locking at where everybody's at. Those that were trying to fit in. A lot of them are dead. They're gone. And they're miserable. So, you know, when we think about the way people look at us and the ridiculing we receive as these walls are coming down because of what we do, it's really hard because it does go against our instinct. And so we receive ridicule. It conflicts with our desires. There's three of these things here. It conflicts with them, doesn't it? And the biggest one is, it just takes too long. <laughs> it takes way too long. And so, when you say that you're trusting somebody, you're trusting God, the world will look at you. And, and you know, and I hear this, you know, sometimes they say, well, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this problem, but I know God will deliver. They look at you like you're a kook. I've seen that look. I, you know, somebody just recently asked me, he said, so what do you think about our country? I said, I don't know, but I know God will fix it one way or another. God's in charge. And the guy looked at me like, 
I could, I could just sense. It's like, whoa, 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 no, that, 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 that's not logical. You know what I mean? So that's the way we feel. We're not giving him the glory. So I want to ask you, what's your Jericho? What's your Jericho? Maybe your Jericho is family problems. Maybe that's the one thing that is just right now at this moment. Every one of these that I'm going to show you and talk about, they're all walls that are coming and going, aren't they? God will bring them down. Sometimes we'll rebuild them. Sometimes life will rebuild them for us, won't they? But trust every wall that you face, whether you put it there or not, God will bring them down. So maybe it's family problems. Maybe it's addiction. And they just seem like there's no way that wall could come down. It would be like those Hebrews standing there looking up at that wall. No way these family problems are going to be fixed because we're thinking about the way we would solve, the way we want these things solved, how I'm going to come over these things, you know? How am I going to, is the wall of not being able to forgive? And a lot of people struggle with that as well. We all have these walls, don't we? This is a big one, you know, when it comes to our health. A lot of Christians are struggling with their health. And it seems like every time you get one step forward, you take 12 back. You know, it's like, you know, you can't even do the one forward, two back. It's like one forward, 12 back. And so we, we allow that to become a wall. We have a wall also where, you know, we have people who like to push our buttons all the time, don't we? Maybe you have that person right now in your life that's kind of pushing that button for you. A job that's a constant frustration, which all jobs have that certain level. But there's points where... That can become a wall that we allow to come up. I tell you, this is one that I have felt a lot, and that's where circumstances seem to just be overwhelming me. And there's a lot of those. And it's not, and it's not like way in my past either. I'm talking within the past year, month, where there's times where I look at stuff that's all around me, and I'm just like, I can't see past them. And even I have to pray and remember that God is going to drop that wall. I don't know when, but he'll drop that wall. I don't know how. And you know what? Sometimes it's not the way I want it. But God is going to drop that wall. Financial problems, who is not with that? Who is not with those problems, right? But you see, there's a wall there. We allow to hold up between us. See, the other bigger part of this is that when we have these walls up, we're not serving God right. We're not enjoying the benefit. That wall is honestly between us and Him. Enabled, and it and limits us in our ability to accomplish this great peace and salvation with God. And enjoy life while all this rages around us. These walls just falling down and us being able to stay connected with God. That's what these walls are. They are putting us, they're coming up between us and God. God will bring your walls down. I want to close with a couple of Psalms that I think will help be encouraging. Psalms 20, verses 6 through 9. Um, actually, I got a little. He says, the psalm that says, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and they've fallen. But we have risen and stand upright. Save Lord. May the king answer us when we call. Many people are trusting in the psychology or the sciences and the chariots and the things of this world. And they're going to fall and they bow down before it, but not his anointed. We, as his children, have been anointed, chosen. And this is the psalm that is so encouraging for us today. The other one I want to share with you is in Psalm 28, 8. I got 88, sorry. <laughs> the Lord is the strength of his people. He is the saving refuge of his anointed. I want you to let the Lord bring those walls down. As ridiculous as it may sound, the plan that he's got laid out, it works. 
You may feel like you're that guy walking around the city just seven times, right? Let the Lord bring your walls down. Why would you not? So this morning as we close this lesson up, I hope you'll take a moment to reflect within yourself and think about how you've been serving God. What is your relationship with God? What is it a, a wall that is between you and Him that you need to tear down? You see, God will bring all those walls, but there's a spiritual wall that you have to bring down first in order to draw close to Him. And that is to admit that you're broken spiritually and that you need your sins forgiven, just like on the day of Pentecost. Once they heard that information, they heard what the apostles said. They said, we are the ones. We're broke. They brought the spiritual wall down. And then they asked the next question. Instead of starting to gather up the bricks and rebuild it, they asked the next question, what do we do about it? And initially, to keep that wall down and destroy it, he says, be baptized, each one of you, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and you will receive forgiveness for your sins. That's the first time. Now, he understands, and that's one of the beautiful things about us as Christians. He knows that we're going we're gonna to sin again. And as Christians, we need to come back and repent to him. Take it seriously. Be selfish about this one thing, and that is your salvation. It's not a salvation by committee. It's a salvation by individuals directly with their relationship with our Heavenly Father. If there's anything we can do, and you're here with us this morning, we hope that while we're going to sing this song, that you'll take a step. Bring the wall down. If you're online and you're joining us and you would like to know more, we would hope that you would reach out through the YouTube and drop a comment there. So let's think about these things while we stand and sing.